Good evening. I'm Ian Wardropper, director of the Frick Collection. Delighted to welcome you tonight to the first uh, in a series of lectures around our wonderful exhibition that just opened on Piero della Francesca in America. And I urge you to look at the various bulletins uh, that we have that will publish the whole list uh, of lectures or consult our website. Um, I'm also glad to see such a large turnout tonight. Um, it's the fact that we often are oversubscribed for our lectures that we've recently started filming uh, our lectures whenever the lecturer will permit us to do so, uh, as is happening tonight. Uh, and so this has been a very useful feature because it allows these lectures to disseminate to a far wider audience, uh, and indeed they're archived on our website and become a resource. Um, to, tonight's lecture is by Machtelt Israels. Uh, she was born in Amsterdam and educated in art history, chemistry, and conservation of works of art before receiving uh, her PhD from the University of Amsterdam with the dissertation Sassetta's Madonna della Neve, an image of patronage. She is now professor at the University of Amsterdam and specializes in Italian Renaissance art and publishes and lectures on the function technique, patronage, and meaning of painting in Tuscany. She was a fellow at Harvard's Villa Itati in 2004-2005, for which she uh, completed a volume on Sassetta's Borgo San Sepulcro altarpiece. Uh, and this was uh, a springboard to a much larger two-volume um, publication on that altarpiece, uh, which is really an exemplary volume in the history of art, bringing together many different uh, scholars from different disciplines to fully explicate uh, this really important uh, altarpiece. Uh, and in many ways, it's this work which um, led Nat Silver, our guest curator for uh, the exhibition, to invite her to contribute uh, to this volume. And Sassetta's precedent um, as a painter and, and maker of altarpieces was uh, a particularly important component uh, of, of this exhibition. Uh, and she and the various other authors for the um, catalog uh, have really uh, brought some new uh, light uh, on the subject of the altarpiece from which the Frick uh, has four uh, panels. I'm uh, very proud of that fact. Uh, and uh, all of the authors have really, uh, I think, moved forward um, and a greater understanding of uh, the altarpiece and the function of it within uh, the town of, of San Sepulcro. Um, and in a larger context of uh, altarpieces in, in the mid-15th century in Italy. Um, Professor Israels has also uh, contributed to the catalogs for the exhibition uh, De Jacopo della Quercia a Donatello, Le Arti a Siena nel Rinascimento, uh, and also for La Primavera del Rinascimento, La Scultura e le Arti a Firenze, uh, so in a larger sense, uh, works in, in Renaissance uh, um, in sculpture, uh, and also uh, in uh, the arts and painting um, in the 15th century. We're delighted that uh, she contributed to uh, the catalog um, here, uh, and uh, we're also thrilled uh, that she would be the first lecture in our series uh, on the subject, so we welcome uh, Professor Israels. Good evening. Thank you for those very kind words, Ian. I am very grateful to the Frick Collections, Nathaniel Silver, Denise Allen, Colin Bailey, and Ian Wardropper for their kind invitation to talk to you tonight. Dr. Silver deserves great admiration for producing an exhibition that is both beautiful and at the cutting edge of art historical and technical scholarship. It is a show that has been eminently and pleasantly collaborative in its preparation and can, in a sense, be seen as a tribute to James Banker, present here, who has studied Piero in his native San Sepulcro for a lifetime. For seven works by Piero della Francesca, all from the artist's Tuscan hometown of San Sepolcro, Nat Silver managed to erect an adoptive home in the center of Manhattan, transforming the Frick collection into a shrine of Renaissance painting and New York into a new San Sepolcro. 
the old San Sepolcro was founded a millennium ago when two pilgrims, Arcano and Giglio, brought relics from the Holy Sepulchre, Santo Sepolcro, in Jerusalem to the upper Tiber Valley in eastern Tuscany, a valley dotted with walnut trees. The new San Sepolcro has now been founded by Nat Silver, bringing seven Renaissance artworks, the relics of modern times, to the mouth of the Hudson River, an area dotted with skyscrapers. <laughs> The San Sepolcro, where Piero della Francesca was born around 1412, and where he kept returning from commissions in Florence, Ferrara, Rimini, Arezzo, Ancona, Pesaro, Rome, Perugia, and Urbino, infrequently at first, and then in his 60s and 70s, more stably, was a town where a Gothic polyptych of circa 1350 done by the Sienese painter Niccolo di Segna, set the tone pictorially. In the town's churches, remarkably, only the high altars received such painted wood altarpieces. The lateral altars, such as here in Sant'Agostino, um, had frescoes and sometimes statues or banners San Sepulchro's high altarpieces were made over protracted periods of time and were prone to strong continuity. Up to the beginning of the 16th century, they took the Gothic shape of polyptics. Native Piero, the artist coveted by Renaissance princes and patricians all over Italy, painted three of these. Um, at the churches of San Giovanni d'Afra, Santa Maria della Misericordia, and Sant'Agostino. We will consider Piero's polyptics for San Sepolcro as part of the tradition of the artist's hometown. It is only in a later panel painting, with a provenance from a house in San Sepolcro, the Virgin and Child with four angels now in Williamstown, that Piero uses a Renaissance format with a rectangular, undivided painted surface. We will consider the Williamstown Virgin, along with the artist's resurrection fresco in the town hall under the heading of the town's homes, in order to see how the artist handled a different local context for panel painting. The Nativity of Christ in London has a provenance from Piero's own house and so has his fresco of Hercules, now in Boston. They will allow us to focus on the challenges of the artist's home. So in three steps, with an increasing sense of zoom, the artist's hometown, the town's homes, and the artist's home, this lecture investigates the extent of Piero's liberty to conform to tradition or deviate from it in his painting in San Sepolcro, by exploring the requirements of type and destination, and by analyzing the artist's response, especially in his treatment of space and novelty of imagery. The baptism of Christ, now in the National Gallery in London, is probably Piero's earliest surviving work, and would have been done not long after 1437, when he was about 25 years old. It was the central panel of a triptych for the high altar of the parish church of San Giovanni Battista in Val d'Afra. The triptych structure had been designed by Antonio d'Anghiari, who was Piero's master, and as apparent from these frescoes, maybe not all too subtle an artist. <laughs> Piero left the triptych incomplete finishing only the baptism, possibly because he soon set out on a more international career. As art historian Mary Berenson first realized, it was the Sienese painter Matteo Di Giovanni who completed the San Giovanni d'Afra triptych, possibly in the early 1460s, with sturdy life-size figures against a gold ground. The Annunciation in the Pinnacle Roundels, and the legend of the Baptist in the Predella. 
all panels that remained behind in San Sepolcro when the baptism, as Mary Berenson noted on the photograph, was sold to London. The coexistence of two very different hands of Pierrot's luminous landscape and blue sky with a Gothic frame and gold ground painting continue to amaze modern eyes to the point of disbelief. Around 1876, Angelo Tricca, in this painting of Piero at home, um, fancifully imagined that had Piero completed the lateral panels, here is a detail, he would have painted on them small scale figures against the landscape setting, continuous with the central baptism. This is unlikely to have been Piero's intention. The altarpiece's framing elements indicate that from the beginning, a pair of freestanding colonnettes flanked the baptism, providing an optic caesura between the three main elements. Triptychs with narrative centers and flanking panels with single saints, hence with a discrepancy in scale between the figures, were common in Piero's time. As in Pietro di Giovanni d'Ambrogio's altarpiece in Asciano of 1448-49, which has a center with the nativity of Christ with small figures against night sky and side panels with large figures of St. Augustine and St. Galganus against gold backgrounds. The structure of the San Giovanni d'Afra triptych was florid Gothic in type and Piero had no say in the design of its carpentry. Piero, followed by Matteo di Giovanni, reacted by conceiving of its different compartments as ever so many windows onto ever so many different realms. Piero showed the baptism in San Sepulcro's world. Christ stands under one of the walnut trees that featured in the town's foundation legend surrounding hills and trade. San Sepulcro itself is shown under the angle familiar to the parishioners of San Giovanni d'Afra, many of whom came from outside town, from the valley of the Afra River, to worship in front of Piero's and Matteo's triptych. Only in the early 1460s did Piero paint a second altarpiece for San Sepolcro, for the flagellant confraternity of Santa Maria della Misericordia, although this project too knew a protracted gestation. In distant 1428, the Confraternity of the Misericordia had commissioned a polyptic structure to the design of the painter Ottaviano Nelli of Gubbio, and I show you a sample of his art, from a local carpenter, Bartolomeo di Giovannino d'Agnolo. Bartolomeo's structure, which remained unpainted for more than two decades, stood on the altar when in 1445 the confraternity commissioned Piero back in San Sepolcro for a brief stay to have a new structure made, similar in shape and dimension to Bartolomeo's of so much time before. The rectors of the confraternity directed Piero to paint figures and scenes at their discretion. Piero was solicited nine years later because he still had not constructed, let alone painted, the altarpiece. That probably only happened between 1461 and 62 when he received final payments. The work survives fairly complete, although without its framing elements. The saints in the main tier of daunting dimensions when compared with the humans gathered under the Virgin's cloak are placed rhythmically with the frontal virgin a stern central axis. Piero painted the central panel before doing the side panels and then returned to the central image to adjust the perspective of the platform, and you can see it here, um, on which the virgin stands, and then again to the lateral panels to adjust, um, to add the supplicant's feet, uh, extending from the central composition. The unquantifiable depth of the gold in the backgrounds and the shallow ledges under the figures unite the multi-panel composition. Whereas Piero seems to have planned compartmentalized imagery for the San Giovanni d'Afra triptych, it was while painting the Misericordia altarpiece 
that he began to conceive of apolyptic's main tier as a single continuous space. The devout gathered under the virgin's mantle in all likelihood include portraits that rooted the image in the reality of Piero San Sepolco. Piero's third high altarpiece commission in San Sepolco was for the church of Sant'Agostino, and this, of course, is the polyptych that is the star of the show here at the Frick. The Augustinian hermits already had a high altarpiece, done around 1348 by the Sienese painter Niccolo di Segna, and now lost, but possibly similar to the resurrection altarpiece by the same artist in the local Camaldolese Abbey. In 1451, a lay benefactor of the Augustinians, Angelo di Simone, who helped to redecorate the church, bought the wood structure of an altarpiece from the friars at San Francesco. In 1426, the Franciscans had commissioned from the carpenter, Bartolomeo di Giovannino d'Agnolo, whom we encountered for the Misericordia Commission, um, um, this structure, or a wood structure, as a copy of Niccolo di Segna's resurrection polyptych. They commissioned Antonio d'Anghiari, assisted by the very young Piero, to paint it, but this did not materialize, and in 1426 they left the structure for what it was and entrusted, and this time with success, the Sienese painter Sassetta to oversee in Siena the construction of a new polyptych painted on both sides, uh, similar to Bartolomeo's structure, which thus became redundant and could be bought by the Augustinians. In 1454, Angelo di Simone and the Augustinians presented Piero with this wood structure, which was basically mid 14th century in type, and asked him to paint it according to their instructions. No adaptations of the carpentry are recorded, and nor have we found any um, technical evidence for, um, for such adaptations on the remaining panels. Between 1469 and 70, Piero delivered his work. As Nathaniel Silver's new reconstruction now clearly shows, Piero painted a blue sky and parapet that continued uninterrupted across all main tier panels behind St. Augustine, now in Lisbon, or now here at the Frick, uh, behind St. Michael, Michael Archangel from the National Gallery in London, behind the central compartment which had um, a virgin and child enthroned, or maybe a coronation, behind the Frick's own um, St. John the Evangelist, and behind um, St. Um, St. Nicholas of Tolentino, which is now in Milan. Features of the central composition uh, continued on the panels to either side of it, and this time not as an afterthought, but as part of the composition, some being incised in the gesso before painting. So the platform here, which is the platform on which the virgin or the figures of the central compartment would have said is incised in the gesso before painting um, began. For greater spatial precision, Piero painted the sky, parapet, steps, and floor, even where he knew he would later cover them by elements of the central composition, some of them since scraped away when the altarpiece was disassembled and its panels became independent gallery paintings, such as maybe um, the remnants of an angel's wing and a blue and a, and a brocade mantle, um, surviving in the origin, in lateral panel originally left of the central one and scraped away in the panel that was to the right of it, exposing the painted steps underneath the drapery. So from the outset, Piero planned the multi-panel composition as a whole. On the Gothic polyptych, Piero achieved unity with a heavenly host lined up on a heavenly stage, revolutionizing the genre of the polyptych by introducing a realistic sky above a continuous parapet. Piero's innovation becomes apparent through a comparison with Fra Angelico's polyptych of the 1430s in San Domenico in nearby Cortona, 
where there is a low wall only behind the saints on the side panels and um, the ground is still gold. Or, by comparison with the Polaiolo, a l'antica altarpiece of around 1466 in San Miniato in Florence, where the parapet has a great opening onto a landscape, procuring deeper, but also more earthly space than Piero's parapet. Piero's sky and parapet localizes figures as though on a vertiginously high and heavenly building but also bring them close to the devout beholder, who was perhaps better used to parapets placed in front of the holy figures, creating a reverent distance. Piero's parapet with its architectural detail seems a glorifying and classicizing feature, a variant of which Piero would also use in the triumphs on the backs of his portraits of the Dukes of Urbino he may have ultimately derived the motive from the attics of triumphal arches. Painters often supply the designs for the carpentry of altarpieces, and this happened in San Sepolcro, but because of the protracted gestation of San Sepolcro's high altarpieces and the inevitability of the town's sense of continuity, Piero was faced with a pre-existing structure for all three high altarpieces that he painted in his hometown. These carpentries must have represented an architectural given for the artist, much as the previously constructed walls of the main chapel of San Francesco in Arezzo did when he prepared his fresco cycle there. Did commissions in different, less tradition-bound contexts give the artist more liberty? When around 1460, Piero was asked to paint a fresco in the newly constructed town hall, he created the illusion of a Corinthian tabernacle opening onto the scene of Christ's resurrection. It could be considered a frescoed variant upon a Renaissance type of altarpiece introduced in Florence decades before. Although Piero's re resurrection has been interpreted as an emblem of San Sepolcro, meaning Holy Sepulchre, in the 15th century, its religious and exhortative function were probably key. Similarly, in the town hall of Siena, the Civitas Virginis, the city of the Virgin, Simone Martini's Maesta instilled devotion in the in assembled governors and implored their wise judgment. Christ's scroll, which is in real parchment, uh, is inscribed, love justice, you who judge the earth. Piero's resurrected Christ with the barren landscape to the left and verdant rejuvenated trees to the right would have invited a balanced and Christian magistrate's choice. The fresco's devotional and moral iconography and altarpiece-like appearance were such that in the early 16th century, an altar was placed under it. Piero's virgin and child enthroned with four angels, now in Williamstown, may be the first altarpiece or medium scale panel painting with a rectangular format um, actually to survive from San Sepolcro. An indication for its date is provided by its mixed use of oil and tempera techniques, resulting, as you can see in the galleries, in um, some areas of hefty crackalure, corresponding with Piero's experiments in the Augustinian altarpiece, but predating the masters um, of Piero's full mastery of the oil medium in the altarpiece for Federico da Montefeltro in Urbino of the early 1470s. Piero may have had a say in the design of this painting's support as the seams between its three planks, visible in uh, raking light, do not interfere with the most important parts of its composition. In 1837, the British art collector, Walter Calverley Trevelyan, bought the Williamstown painting as, I quote, formerly in the gallery of Gerardi Cristofori, of Borgo San Sepolcro, the native place of Pietro, from the art dealer Domenico Biccoli in Florence. Frank de Bell has suggested 
that the work's patron might therefore have been Gerardo di Cristoforo Gerardi or his son Cristoforo, rich merchants active in San Sepolcro's government in the second half of the 15th century. Trevelyan uses the genitives Gerardi Cristofori for the name of the owner and Pietro instead of Piero for the name of the artist, suggesting maybe that he knew of the record of a Latin inscription with the patron's name and artist's signature, possibly once on the original frame and uh, possibly in similar in writing to that on his flagellation signed Opus Petri de Burgo Sancti Sepulcri, and in its placement uh, to that of the resurrection. The single altar in San Leonardo del Monacato, which by 1496 the Gerardi used as burial chapel, seemed the most likely of various chapels with, it, with which the Williamstown painting has been tentatively associated. However, Piero did not include the titular saint of the chapel, nor the founder saints of San Sepolcro, Arcano and Giglio, whose relics were kept in this chapel. Moreover, Piero's composition, showing in the corner of a courtyard the Virgin enthroned on a two-step platform revered by four standing angels, has a variable sense of a center, difficult to accord with an altar that has a privileged frontal view, as in San Leonardo. The head of Piero's Virgin is along the vertical axis, but the centric point is to the right of it. And the courtyard's side colonnade is visible only on the right, whereas the single column of the back colonnade is to the left of the Virgin. The preferred viewing position is a lateral one, would be to the right here. As in Piero's Madonna del Parto, which has recently been shown to have been frescoed over a lateral altar, not the high altar, of Santa Maria Momentana in Monterchi. The Williamstown Virgin may have been designed for a lateral altar, or it may rather have been designed for a Gerardi uh, family palace, since that is its first documented provenance. In 1583, the, car the carpenter Berto Alberti reported dismantling and replacing the frame of a quadro di Mastro Pietro di la Francesca, then in a Gerardi palace. Its dimensions would befit a chapel or a hall in a private dwelling and are, for instance, slightly smaller than those of Filippo Lippi's adoration of the Christ child of the late 1450s for the chapel of Palazzo Medici in Florence. Both a setting in a side chapel, uh, in a church, or maybe more likely in a palace hall or palace chapel, would be new for paintings on wood in San Sepolcro. They were locations without binding visual traditions for panel painting, where Piero would have the liberty to introduce the rectangular format as he had seen it emerge in Florence and to experiment with the possibilities offered by a single unified field. As Matteo Ceriana noted, the pres precedent for Piero's painted architecture is the setting of the Santa Lucia dei Magnoli altarpiece by Domenico Veneziano. Whereas Domenico paints his saints against an exedra as though it were a three-dimensionalized polyptic frame internalized in the painting, Piero, in the Williamstown painting, as in the Montefeltro altarpiece, treats his setting as though it were a slice of a view inside a real building, probably in the case of the Williamstown painting, an atrium. And as in the Montefeltro painting, Piero uses a telescopic, deep perspective projection. The figures are close to the picture plane, against the backdrop of a monumental architecture that has a depth that is not immediately apparent. It is the elbow of the Baptist um, that, in the Montefeltro altarpiece, makes it clear that the figures are placed before the crossing of the church, way in front of the deep main chapel. It is the shadow of a column falling over the uh, platform of the Virgin that defines the space of the Williamstown painting. It shows, I think, that there is an open colonnade 
closely in front of the figures, just outside the picture space, in the realm of the spectator, letting in the light from an oblique angle. Pierrot's architecture is an atrium that is open on the front. Whereas in his polyptics, the sparseness of architectural circumscription of space made his figures monumentally present, but also heavenly distant. In the Williamstown painting, the space is accessible and the beholder implied in it. The horizon is situated more or less at the height of the angel's belts, and the viewing point is that of a devotee kneeling within the atrium's front colonnade. No built equivalents exist for Piero's painted architecture, but he made eclectic use of antique precedent and of cutting edge architectural theory and practice of his own day. He adheres to the Vitruvian canon when he puts a trabeation um, on his columns where Luciano Laurana for, the, for Federico da Montefeltro in Urbino had deviated from it with arches on columns. With a sense of varietas worthy of Leon Battista Alberti, he invents a corner solution of a pier instead of a column, which is moreover Corinthian, not composite like the columns. Piero's bipartite um, trabeation with a cornice and a frieze, but no architrave, reflects experiments such as Maso di Bartolomeo's portal of 1451-54 for San Domenico in Urbino, and might ultimately be inspired by the use of spolia in, for example, San Lorenzo Fori le Mura in Rome, where door lintels and friezes are made to rest directly on the capitals. Piero's imaginative recreation of classical and classicizing examples is clear also in the Virgin's seat, of which the once beautifully decorated spheres or balls topping the front and back lag are visible in stark perspective. It is a sella curulis, or curule chair, which was the prerogative of Roman magistrates and in the Middle Ages developed into the faldistorium, its legs now turned 90 degrees, distinguishing kings, popes, and bishops. Piero had a great predilection for the Sela Curullis, or Faldistorium, which he uses in the proper etymological sense of a chair placed on a curus, or cart, in the triumphs of the Dukes of Urbino, but also placed on a platform, it's covered by a, a cloth, for Saint Sigismund receiving the homage of Sigismondo Pandolfo Malatesta, for Pilate sitting in his terrible majesty in the flagellation, for the empty canopied throne of King Cosro in the Arezzo cycle, and for the Virgin in the Montefeltro altarpiece. Although painters before Piero had used the Roman chair, such as Masaccio, in the adoration of the Pisa altarpiece, wittily pairing a horse saddle or sella <laughs> with the elevated status um, of the sella curullis, Piero made, with the exception of his Perugia altarpiece and I think the Augustinian altarpiece, exclusive use of it. He may have drawn his inspiration from Roman reliefs representing a ruler's distribution of money, such as on the second century relief from a triumphal arch of Marcus Aurelius, or from coins such as his Aureus of Antoninus Pius, in which the chair is placed on a platform as in the Williamstown painting. Piero empowered his Madonnas and rulers with the ancient symbol of liberality and supremacy. On a rectangular panel, Piero created a deep architectural space. In its accessibility, verisimilitude, and learned antique precedent, quite different from his polyptics for San Sepolcro. It may have been the novelty of the type in San Sepolcro, a panel painting meant not for a high altar, but probably for a palace, that allowed the artist to give free rein to humanist interests in, the, in antiquity and in the mathematics and perspective um, of light. In this Renaissance climate, in the San Sepolcro of the late um, 1460s, 
the artist's own house holds a special place. The family palazzo, where Piero lived with his brothers and their families, is still one of San Sepolcro's largest, even though it was deprived of its upper floor, here still visible, um, following a fire in 1536 and has been much restored. As studied by James Banker, the corner of Via delle Giunte and Via Borgo Nuovo had been the site of the family's home since the 1340s. Following acquisitions of neighboring property in 1465, it was reconfigured. After many peregrinations and the death of his father Benedetto in 1464, Piero had taken San Sepolcro as his permanent residence. As the oldest man in the house, he headed his extended family and would have overseen the family house's amplification. Giorgio Vasari writes that Piero left in San Sepolcro excellent property and some houses that he himself had built for his own use. In 1509, Luca Pacioli, mathematician and Piero's compatriot, otherwise jealously avid of praise, had to admit that in our day, Master Piero della Francesca was the monarch of painting and architecture. The family house's pre-existing structures were masked behind a regular facade with Renaissance tabernacle windows, which, along with other details such as corbels and door frames inside the palace, date to Piero's lifetime and resemble his painted architecture. Its Corinthian capitals compare well to those in Piero's Augustinian and Montefeltro altarpieces, as does the Anthemian and Palmette frieze of the entablature of its door frames. On the palace's lower levels were cellars, stables, and shops. On the piano nobile, reception rooms, including a sala or a hall, and on the upper floor, most of the rooms used by different members of the family. It was well furnished and had, for example, silver tableware and luxury items such as a silk fabric with a pattern of figures. It is now, unfortunately, as you can see, but a shadow is of its former glorious self. Some of the furniture had intarsia, or wood inlay work, including a lettuccio, or daybed may be similar to this example from Siena. Noble families of the time also had a taste for intarsia furniture, such as Filippo Strozzi, who around 1470 commissioned an intarsia lettuccio from Giuliano da Maiano, and at a lavish scale, Piero's patron, Duke Federico da Montefeltro in Urbino. An artwork with an intriguing provenance from Piero's home is his Nativity of Christ. Painted in oil, it was probably done in the 1470s. Although it is sadly much abraded, the presence of highlights, also in the most damaged areas, um, indicates that contrary to what is often stated, it was not left unfinished by the artist. The painting is mentioned as part of Piero's inheritance in the family home in 1500 and again in 1514, and whereas some paintings on the lists are mentioned as unfinished, the nativity is not. In 1698, it results still in family hands, and in 1825, a descendant, Giuseppe Franceschi Marini, puts it up for sale. As recently argued by Marilyn Arenberg Levin, its continued presence in the house since at least 1500 suggests that Piero designed it for his own home, just as he may have made the Williamstown Virgin for that of the Gerardi. The size of Piero's nativity seems to exclude it from the genre of devotional panels often present in bedrooms and studies. One could instead maybe imagine it in a house chapel or hall. In the 19th century, the nativity was recorded in a chapel in the Della Francesca Palazzo, but it is unclear whether this was a pre-existent feature. On a hill overlooking a valley and a city, 
Placed before a ruinous shed, Piero paints the Virgin kneeling to adore her newborn son lying on the ground, just as St. Bridget of Sweden had seen in a vision. Five musician, musician angels, the donkey, the ox, two shepherds and St. Joseph are in attendance. Since one shepherd points up and the other looks up, the composition may have included an upper section. Like Andrea della Robbia's Nativity of Christ of circa 1485 from Santa Chiara in San Sepolcro, it may have had an, 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 an annunciation in a lunette. This may be identifiable with a painting with images uh, of the Virgin with which the Nativity is listed in the inventory of 1500 of the Della Francesca house and with a painting of the Annunciate with which it is inventoried in 1514. During Piero's last years, lunettes became the fashion in San Sepolcro, and Piero may well have been its instigator, since he oversaw the construction of the now lost, but we know that it was art-shaped, um, Picchi family chapel in the abbey in the early 1480s. By the beginning of the 16th century, altarpieces with lunettes would be the rule in town probably in Perugino's new high altarpiece for the Abbey, and certainly in Rosso Fiorentino's and Raffaellino del Colle's altarpiece for the confraternity of the Holy Cross, and Raffaellino's single-handed altarpiece for a side altar in the Abbey. Piero's nativity embroiders on the Brigittine theme of adoration and recognition of the newborn savior in its consort of angels, braying donkey and attentively gazing ox, but also in the hitherto never well explained magpie. In the 14th century chapter house decoration at Pomposa, and I thank Daniele Benati for this slide, the magpies seem depicted as creatures recognizing their Lord, um, the Lamb of God, um, depicted between them, there are two of them. Piero may have painted uh, the black and white bird with in mind an epigram by Marshall, quoted in medieval bestiaries and an actuality in Piero's day through philologist Giorgio Merola, who published the first comprehensive edition of the Epigrammata in Venice in 1471. I, a talking magpie, salute you as my master with distinct voice. If you did not see me, you would not believe me to be a bird. <laughs> so Piero's magpie would thus be part of the choir of creatures recognizing their savior or master. Only in later times, the magpie would be exposed as an ordinary scoundrel, as thief of small glistening objects. Sorry. Piero has divided the hilltop in two patches, the half on which the virgin kneels is bare. The other patch, on which she has extended her mantle to lay down her child, is verdant. This use of the phases of nature in the context of salvation corresponds to the symbolism of barren and green trees as a moral and Christian symbol of spiritual rebirth in Piero's resurrection. In the nativity, I love this detail, rejuvenation is present even in the seedling um, at the foot of the cut tree. In the shades of blue of the angelic garments, the nativity might allude to elements of the daily life of a San Sepulcro family become rich through the trade of the blue dye stuff road. The cityscape is quite similar to the view from the De La Francesca house. The landscape is evocative of the upper Tiber Valley, maybe of the surroundings of the family's country retreat at Bastia, where Piero in 1468 sought refuge from the plague. Filippino Lippi, in his virgin and child for the Strozzi family country house of Il Palagio near Florence, made a similar localizing and appropriating use of landscape. So, in addition to its devotional aim, the painting alludes to San Sepolcro topography and life, and possibly to the humanist pursuits of Piero. 
in a house decorated with Alantica architectural elements and intarsia furniture, Marshall's reverend magpie would have struck a familiar chord, much as the figure of Joseph, as Ehrenberg Levin has suggested, may have brought to mind the first century BC Roman bronze of the Spinario or thorn puller, here in a copy by Antico, well known to the Frick. Piero's creation of a humanist self-image transpires most of all from his only surviving mythological figure, a fresco that was detached from the Della Francesca house. Around 1885, the Hercules was discovered in the palace's hall, where antiques dealer Stefano Bardini detached it in or before 1892. The fragmentary fresco bought by Isabella Stewart Gardner for her museum in Boston, <laughs> shows the life-size hero standing in an opening with a stone frame. And behind him, seen steeply from below, the wooden beams of a ceiling resting on corbels. Hercules was detached from above a door in the corner of the hall where the room's real beams would have appeared to continue in the fresco space. The present ceiling is not original, but on the lower floor of the house there are beams and corbels similar to those in the fresco. The painted frieze on the sides of the beams in Piero's fresco is similar to that present on the 15th century door frames surviving in the house. That the ceiling is roughly from Piero's time is indicated by the similar, though obviously more luxurious, carved corbels and ornamented beams of the early 1490s in the Borgia apartment in the Vatican. Several scholars hold Piero's Hercules to be an independent allegory of force and emblem, possibly allusive of Monterchi or Mons Hercules, the birthplace of Piero's mother. For others, starting with Roberto Longhi, Piero's Hercules would have been part of a series of illustrious men. Piero could have known about such programs that powerful families of his time used in the halls of their homes to broadcast historical, historical and venerable images of themselves. In the first half of the century, now lost cycles were painted by Lorenzo di Bici for Giovanni di Bici dai Medici in the first Casa Medici in Florence, by Masolino for Cardinal Giordano Orsini in Rome, and by Paolo Uccello for the Vitaliani family in Padua. Among Piero's own clientele, Federico da Montefeltro in Urbino had had Justus von Ghent and Pedro Berruguete paint panels with illustrious man in his study. Here, the backgrounds in the Euclid and Vittorino da Feltre, consisting of a ceiling with beams, were continuous. If the Hercules was also one of a cycle, the beams partially visible behind him would have continued behind other now lost figures to the left. Figures with the illusion of the same ceiling behind them may have filled the hall's other walls. Between 1448 and 49, Andrea del Castagno had frescoed a cycle of illustrious men and women in Filippo Carducci's villa at Legnaia near, near Florence. Parts have been detached and are now in the Uffizi. Castagno placed his figures in niches in a fictive classicizing architecture. The first such series to survive from a private dwelling, Castagno's cycle follows in its celebration of many local heroes, including Dante, Petrarca, and Boccaccio, and in its architectural organization, the recommendation by Alberti in his De Re Edificatoria that it is most appropriate for a portico, this was a loggia, or a dining hall to be painted or sculpted with scenes of bravery by the citizens. I would therefore have separate stone frames in which to place pictures and um, also panels. Statues in rectangular niches with inscriptions had 
as described by Suetonius, existed in the porticos or loggias of the Forum of Augustus. Castagno's fictive architecture thus laid claim to Roman credentials. Piero's Hercules in his niche, likely with companions, would have done the same. In Sala della Francesca, the sense of, pre of presence of Piero's life-size figure, figures with the realistic continuation of the ceiling and the foreshortened club of the hero sticking into the spectator's space would have been uncanny. With the Hercules, Piero put his palace on a par with those of several important families on the Italian peninsula and would have aligned his humanist interests with the social aspirations of his family. The leather worker, Benedetto della Francesca, fathered two mer merchants, a monk and a painter, Piero, grandfathered spouses of the local elite and generated considerable wealth. Piero himself moved in the circles of the princely and the learned. In the 16th century, an ambitious artist such as Vasari also adorned his abodes in Arezzo and Florence with painted programs of historical and mythological figures. The subversive Sienese painter Giacomo Pacchiarotti, active in the first half of the 16th century, according to a novella by Pietro Fortini, was an idiot who had made in a room a kind of senate by painting seats all around with the faces of many people, in the middle of which he would sit as though he were a prince. And standing there in the tribunal, he would have long and high conversations with his paintings. <laughs> Learned humanist pictorial programs in artists' houses are best known from the 16th century, but Piero may have been one of its pioneers. Piero's Williamstown, Virgin and Child, and London Nativity were possibly made for family palaces and were free of the requirements of the tradition of the genre of the high altarpiece in San Sepolcro that the artist had operated in during his commissions by the parish priest of San Giovanni d'Afra, the confraternity of Santa Maria della Misericordia, and the friars of Sant'Agostino. The Williamstown Virgin gave Piero an occasion to develop the Renaissance rectangular painted surface. The nativity, possibly to take that experiment further by adding a lunette. In his five panel paintings for San Sepolcro, Piero increasingly exploited the wood structures available to him to offer a lucid and ever more accessible window on the world of God and the saints. With the passing of time, but also with the exploitation and introduction of different genres less bound to local traditions, Piero developed a greater liberty and enriched the vocabulary of his art with light and mathematical perspective ever tighter related to the space of the beholder and with imagery and iconography reinvigorated by antique precedent. Finally, in the artist's home, in the Nativity of Christ with its subtle, devotional, local, and classicizing symbolism, and in the bold, palatial, and classicizing claim of the Hercules, we witness the degree of liberty that arises at the rare occasion when the personae of a Renaissance patron and painter merge. Thank you. <laughs>